Hello, everyone. We're about to start the webinar and begin recording. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Potential Health Impacts of Fracking in California webinar. My name is Sue Chang, and I'm the Pollution Prevention Director at the national nonprofit organization, the Center for Environmental Health. We at the Center for Environmental Health focus on the protection of families and communities from toxic chemicals. Our energy and environmental health program investigates the potential health impacts associated with fracking and unconventional oil and gas development on women of childbearing age, pregnant women, and infants and children. Two of CEH's recent peer-reviewed papers on the health effects of unconventional oil and gas operations were cited in the New York State Department of Health's report to Governor Andrew Cuomo, which served as the basis for his decision to ban fracking in New York. Over the last century, the fossil fuel industry has exhausted much of the easily accessible oil and gas reserves around the country through conventional oil and gas extraction techniques. In the past decade, companies have been using different and often new technologies to unlock oil and gas from previously inaccessible locations. In many states across the U.S., high-volume hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, is being used to mine oil and gas deposits primarily in shale formations in places like Pennsylvania, Texas, North Dakota, Wyoming, Arkansas, Colorado, and other states. And these practices have been largely unregulated. California is currently the fourth largest producer of oil in the country, and fracking accounts for roughly half of the 300 new wells installed each month. Fracking in California is different from much of the rest of the country due to the state's underlying geology where oil from shale migrates into smaller pools closer to the Earth's surface. There is still much that is unknown about how fracking and other types of well stimulation and enhanced oil recovery techniques may be affecting our air, water, soil, and food, our quality of living, the health of workers, and surrounding communities, and ultimately our climate. To address these complex issues, we are pleased to have Dr. Barbara Sattler and Robert Gould as speakers on today's webinar to shed light on the potential health concerns of fracking and describe the role health professionals can play in California. Dr. Sattler will present first, followed by Dr. Gould. We will then move to a question and answer session. For the Q&A, all participants will remain muted. To submit your question, please type it into the questions box in the control panel on your screen. For any nurses who are seeking continuing education credit, you will need to complete an evaluation, which you can request from Davis Baltz of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. His contact information will be posted during the Q&A period. Dr. Barbara Sattler is a professor in public health at the University of San Francisco and a nursing leader in the area of environmental health. She has been an advisor to the EPA's Office of Child Health Protection and the National Library of Medicine for informational needs of health professionals on environmental health. Dr. Sattler has been the recipient of NIEHS, USDA, and EPA grants. She is a founding member of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, an international organization that is helping to integrate environmental health into nursing education, practice, research, and policy and advocacy. She is the author of Environmental Health and Nursing and a host of peer-reviewed articles. Her presentation will address the potential human health effects associated with fracking and unconventional oil and gas development. I'm going to turn it over to Barb now. All right. So um, my name is Barb Sattler, as, as was mentioned, and I'm delighted to be able to speak with you today. Uh, first, a caveat, I am not a geochemical engineer. I'm a registered nurse. and so. The way in which I'm going to be approaching this is, um, is from having looked at the literature, having been to some fracking sites, um, and having been working with the communities that have been affected by, um, by fracking in a variety of uh, states back east. And I just started working on this in California, where there are some differences and many similarities. So first, um, I'd like to just show you that fracking happens where there are what are called shale plays. These are places where gas and or oil is deposited um, deep in the ground in, uh, in geological formations in which there are little tiny minuscule uh, gas and oil pockets. 
And, um, and so what you see on, the, on this slide is the places where in California, for instance, we have the Monterey Shale. Um, and, and this um, is mostly the area that we're concerned around about right now. I do want you to know that it's not just in Monterey, that it, it goes all the way up into the Central Valley. And, um, and so the basics of fracking are that um, we drill deep into the earth. We then start to drill horizontally. Down that drill hole, we put under very, very high pressure a combination of things that include a slew of different chemicals. I'll talk a little bit more about those chemicals. Um, that some are propellants, some are explosives, some are greasy and oily and have things slipping and sliding, and um, many solvents as well, as well as silica, which is um, a sand-like substance, and water, large quantities of water. All of that under high pressure then gets um, pushed down into this horizontal pipe and it, um, it explodes and fractures the geological formations that are there and there are several different kinds of geological formations and it allows the gas and or oil to be released and then they suck back up those, that mixture of water and chemicals and so forth and then they start extracting the gas and oil. So once they've pulled all of this um, uh, all of this fluid back up, they have to do something with it, and I'll talk a bit more about that. But generally, it's, it's held in a holding pond uh, for a short period of time, and uh, thereafter, that has to be disposed of. I'll talk about the disposal. The gas and oil itself is then either trucked um, or piped to another location where it is trucked or railed to its final location at, um, at a refinery. So this shows you a drill site. This is one that's, um, that's uh, currently in operation. And this shows you some of the types of trucks and truck activity. The trucks that are on the top right, the red ones, are providing the high pressure at the frac site. The trucks that are on the bottom left and right are bringing uh, either water, um, which sometimes is trucked in, or the uh, gallons and gallons of toxic chemicals that are often used. Um, this often happens in small rural areas that are really not prepared to accommodate that kind of truck traffic. Um, the other thing that has to happen is that they put these pipes to move the gas and oil along is you have these transfer sta stations. And these transfer stations alone are also um, sites where there can be hazardous exposures. Um, as you can see here, the most, one of the most important ones, hydrosulfate, um, which is down at the bottom, H2S may be present. This is a highly um, toxic chemical, and at, at this particular site, they had uh, a station where, um, where there are emergency respirators. But there are no emergency respirators given to anybody in the community that may live on the fence line to these particular activities. So here's the breathing apparatus, emergency breathing apparatus that, that would need to be used if an alarm were to go off um, showing that the hydrosulfate levels were high. The other thing that happens with fracking is they, it uses a lot of water. Um, and this is a particular concern for us in California, particularly the Central Valley, <coughs> pardon me, where water is really precious right now. Um, and that's just something for us to consider. So um, once the, one of the things that we also need to note is that when the waste is extracted and the water is extracted and the gas and oil, there can also be naturally occurring radioactive materials that have been safely way down deep in the earth and we're now bringing them up. So each frack in the, in the, in the fracking that we've seen in other parts of the country takes about one million gallons of water. Any individual fracking well can be fracked um, up to 10 times. Um, and that's about 200 water trucks per frack if you're, if you're bringing water in, which we would be doing in California. Each individual frack then takes 40,000 gallons of chemicals. 
And um, in California, we are also doing something a little bit different. We're, we're doing something called acidizing. There are two different kinds of mechanisms here, and this depends on the type of geological um, presence there. One is matrix, and that is done under low pressure, and the other is fracturing, and this would be using acids under high pressure. Um, this is um, more usually done in aging wells and in the final stages of production. The two acids that are used are hydrochloric and hydrofluoric acid. It's been noted by industry sources that the hydrofluoric acid can be used up to 30% solutions. This is really, really low pH. This is a really a dangerous level. And um, if there is a hydrofluoric or hydrochloric acid accident or spill, it can create a cloud that can cause severe burns and respiratory um, problems. And if they are dense enough and at high enough levels, they can cause unconsciousness and death. And um, so this is of a particular concern because this is what they're doing in Southern California. Then we've got this fracking waste, um, and it may go into a lined uh, pond, and in many instances it does, but in California there's no requirement for a lined pond, so those chemicals could go into just an online hole in the ground and then leach into the ground. Sometimes it goes into then a permanent storage tank, other times it is re-injected. After they've extracted the gas and oil, they re-inject the the toxic chemicals back into the site. Other things they may do is deep well injection in somebody else's backyard. Um, this has more often than not happened, happened in uh, communities that are already affected by a, a, a range of other sort of social injustices. And or it can be sprayed. Um, and in some states, it's actually legal to spray this on the roads to prevent um, dust from happening. There are, of the 353 chemicals that we know are being used in fracking, and these there may be exposures during transport if there's a spill or a leak or an accident. They're in the holding ponds that are not required to be covered, so they can be volatilizing while they're being re-injected or during road spray. So they're a variety of ways that humans can have some, humans and our whole ecology can have some exposure to this. In the peer-reviewed literature, of those 353 chemicals, 75% of them have some uh, peer-reviewed articles showing toxicity um, to the skin, eye, respiratory tract, and GI, um, the gastrointestinal tract. 40 to 50% of them have um, peer-reviewed uh, indica science indications that they can be harmful to the brain and, and the rest of the nervous system, that they're immunotoxicants, and that they can create problems for the cardiovascular and kidney system. 37% of them are endocrine-disrupting chemicals, and 25% are either carcinogenic or mutagenic. The acute health effects that we're seeing around the country, these are happening immediately um, to the people in the neighborhoods around the frac sites are nausea and vomiting, blows, uh, nosebleeds, but particularly nosebleeds in children, flu-like symptoms, and just malaise, headaches, and um, also we've seen hair loss. Um, a, a particular study I wanted to call out because I think this is um, something that especially any of the um, health professionals on, on the um, call would be very interested in um, is that Children who are born to mothers who live within a mile and a half, a mile and a half of a frac site, have statistically significantly lower APGAR scores um, in their babies. So APGAR scores are the scores that are given to the baby at the time of birth and then a few minutes later. And the, um, you can see APGAR is an acronym. It stands for the appearance. You want a nice pink baby. You don't want a blue baby. Um, their pulse heart rate should be within normal limits. Their grimace, meaning if you, if you touch them or pinch them a little, they should startle. Um, they should be active. They should not be floppy babies. They should have muscle tone, and their respiration should be within normal limits. What we know is that babies who have been born to moms within a mile and a half compared to those who live further out have statistically significantly lower APGAR scores. 
The other kinds of things that are happening are these social side effects. Um, we've seen increases in DWIs well, um, because we're, there are a, a lot more people who are not from those communities that are now working in those communities. Um, increased sexually transmitted diseases, uh, increased use of social and health services, and displaced seniors and other vulnerable populations. In North Dakota right now, they actually have higher rental rates than in the San Francisco Bay Area because there are so many frac workers looking for so few houses. Um, the other thing that happens is we see high levels of ground level ozone. This is caused by the many diesel um, spewing vehicles. Um, ozone is associated with asthma, chronic lung diseases, and premature aging of the lungs. The air pollution, um, also the truck traffic and increases, traffic accidents, damage to the roads, congestion, things that I've mentioned before. Um, this is a picture of the, what they call the man camps in North Dakota, and I visited um, Texas not too long ago and saw several of these man camps. And these are folks that do not otherwise come from these communities and are um, brought in from other parts of the country. The other things that can happen is uh, blowouts, uh, earthquakes. We've seen earthquakes in Ohio and Louisiana um, in places where we've never really seen earthquake activity, and the industry calls it induced seismic events. They don't call it earthquakes. Um, contaminate, contaminated groundwater, uh, surface waters, and soil. Um, right now, over 15 million Americans live within a mile of a fracking site, and the, uh, there, the gas and oil industry has wound up getting itself absolved from many, many of the laws um, that would otherwise give workers and um, and community members the right to know about a lot of information that we currently don't have. One of the things that they've been able to absolve themselves are health setback requirements. There is currently no setback requirement, meaning you can put a frac site at the fence yard of a school, a playground, a home, a hospital, a nursing home. So all of these vulnerable populations and community populations could have a frac site right next to them. When I left Texas after um, doing a tour of the frac sites, I was in the plane, I took this photograph. This is what the frac sites looked like from the sky. It's, it's really just sort of pocking the, um, the whole landscape. And um, this was a photograph of what a particular area in the Midwest looked like. Um, you could imagine the top one looking like a lot of the Central Valley where we've got fruits and vegetables. After fracking, um, it looks like a moonscape. Health professionals are beginning to really mobilize on this. The American Nurses Association, as part of their energy, energy resolution, has actually called for a moratorium on fracking, largely because the science that's evolving is really showing us that this can cause grave health effects, and we don't know the long-term health effects. We just plain don't know that. The Interns in Residence Division of the American Medical Association has also called for a banning. And so this is something that, you know, everybody in healthcare should know should know about this and should be weighing in on this. Um, and uh, we just appreciate um, uh, those of you who are on the call uh, to generate more opportunities for us to come and talk in your health systems, with your community members, with your health professional specialty organizations, and, um, and really begin to bring our voices to uh, Governor Brown in particular, who has the authority to call for a moratorium. Uh, in our state. And so with that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sattler. Uh, as a reminder, we'll be responding to questions after our second speaker, but feel free to submit questions at any time by typing into the questions box in the control panel on your screen. Our next speaker is Dr. Robert Gould. Dr. Gould graduated from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and worked as a pathologist at Kaiser Medical Center in San Jose for over 30 years. In 2012, Bob was named Associate Adjunct Professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at the UCSF School of Medicine to serve as Director of Health Professional Outreach and Education 
for the UCSF Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment. Since 1989, he has served as president of the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility and served as president of National PSR in 2003 and 2014. Dr. Gould's presentation will focus on the role health professionals can play in preventing harm from the potential environmental and public health hazards of fracking in California. He will touch on the recent decision by Governor Andrew Cuomo to ban high volume hydraulic fracturing in New York and how the voice of health professionals was a key factor in that decision. So with that, I will turn the controls over to Dr. Gould. Oh, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can hear you, and okay. I see your slides. Sorry, I, was, I was having trouble getting my mute off, so uh, thank you, uh, Sue, and for Barb for her uh, excellent uh, presentation. Um, and uh, like Sue said, I'll be uh, uh, I'll hopefully not be overlapping uh, much with uh, many of the health issues that uh, Dr. Sadler brought up. And we'll more be focusing on uh, some of the additional responses of health professionals beyond the ones that uh, Dr. Sadler indicated, such as the resolution of the ANA and the AMA uh, resident. So um, in terms of uh, my organization, just a brief background, many of you may well know Physicians for Social Responsibility. We are the United States affiliate of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War and shared in the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1985 in those efforts. Uh, we expanded uh, in the early 1990s uh, beyond our continued uh, work against nuclear weapons to deal with a vast array of environmental health issues, including global warming, fracking, et cetera. As indicated here, our mission, guided by the values and expertise of medicine and public health, PSR works to protect human life from the gravest threats to health and survival. And within that mission, uh, we have certainly uh, uh, been glad to work with many other health organizations in our opposition to uh, fracking activities. Uh, a good starting point uh, is indeed the recent uh, victory of, in New York in terms of Governor Cuomo's decision to ban fracking operations after a uh, multi-year moratorium that was in place because of concerns about many of the health issues that are rising among the population uh, in, in New York State. Uh, and uh, this decision was made without us knowing fully uh, all of the health impacts because of a number of issues that I'll get into in terms of the lack of studies, uh, et cetera. It's interesting, even in the editorial of the New York Times, that this was announced that the acting health commissioner, Dr. Zucker, uh, while saying that the science isn't there to say definitively whether hydraulic fracturing is safe or not, he advised against going forward, uh, posing, would I live in a community with hydraulic fracturing based on the facts that I have now? He said at one point, would I let my child play in a school field nearby? After looking at the questions raised in numerous reports, he said, my answer is no. So uh, one of the main impetuses for this has been the extraordinary efforts of health professionals in uh, New York, particularly the activities of the concerned health professionals in, of New York led by folks such as uh, Sandra Steingraber, uh, PSR colleagues, Dr. Larissa DeRisca, uh, in association with other uh, physicians and health professionals who are working on this. While we don't have many health studies, in fact very few, uh, which has uh, hampered our efforts to get a real handle on these issues. The Concerned Health Professionals of New York, uh, most recently, in fact a few days before the announcement of, of the ban, released their second compendium of scientific, medical, and media findings demonstrating risks and harms of fracking. With accumulating evidence, although again this is not an assemblage of uh, scientific or peer-reviewed studies, although they are contained within the compendium, this compendium attempts to bring together all sorts of reports to show the weight of the evidence that's in, that underscores a number of questions that are there, and the fact that much, there's been a, a rapid increase in reports of all sorts, including uh, self-reported illnesses around fracking sites and stuff, 
that's uh, made this particular uh, assemblage of material very compelling to us to take a precautionary approach, given that we know many of the, many of the, uh, the uh, deleterious effects of chemicals that are used, still questions about those that we don't have information on, but a need to have the burden of proof be on the companies that are using it, not subjecting populations of New York or here in California to basically a, a human experiment with uh, all of these chemicals and processes that are in operation. And as part of the, uh, the, the work of the Concerned Health Professionals in New York, they did an extraordinary job in organizing uh, professional associations and uh, physicians and other health professionals throughout the state. As you can see on this list, uh, it included resolutions of the Medical Society of the State of New York that called for moratorium because of the accumulating evidence of uh, potential uh, harm. Now, it was uh, mentioned uh, that uh, among many of the health professional associations that we needed to take action and a moratorium needed to be put in place while and, and to develop, in the meantime, much more scientific and health studies because of the lack uh, thereof. Uh, Seth Shankov and colleagues at the Physician Scientists and Engineers for Healthy Energy analyzed a lot of the issues of, uh, of these reports that have been out and in December uh, issued this paper that um, talked about what is the quality of these uh, various reports, where are the various data gaps, et cetera. They did a very uh, tight uh, analysis in terms of reviewing the uh, literature. Uh, underscoring, as in the first point, that 73% of the reports that have come out of all scientific reports have really only accumulated over the last two years, uh, indicating the increased understanding uh, from a wide variety of sources of the potential harm. In analyzing such reports, they only included primary research papers that showed direct impacts between health, looked at papers between 2000 and 2014, because that's basically when these have accumulated, and looked at health, health outcome studies and epidemiologic um, investigations, which have been very paltry in terms of being able to guide healthcare professionals and to give them the information uh, that they need. They also included studies, although they're not direct health impacts, of what uh, direct uh, scientific research has been on air and water quality. Uh, one of the uh, things that uh, came out in terms of their uh, major findings is that 96% of all health papers and 87% of original health papers showed an indication of risk or potential health outcomes. 72% of water quality papers showed indication of potential positive association or other issues related to water contamination. 95% of air quality papers showed indication of, uh, of significant air pollution emissions and or atmospheric concentration. So although the evidence is not completely in, those reports that do exist do raise significant questions that underscore precautionary approach towards these processes. These are this latest report uh, uh, from physician scientists and engineers uh, for healthy environment uh, followed on a uh, much more rigorous examination that Dr. Shankov and colleagues had in, uh, in environmental health perspectives in April of this year that went into much more detail of what the accumul accumulating uh, health impacts are along the lines of what Dr. Sadler had indicated. One of the important points, as indicated in this slide, is that important data gaps persist, that there's a need for a measurement of uh, various concentrations indoors and outdoors, and that the most perhaps the most important information gap is the overall lack of any epidemiological studies, particularly to determine potential health outcomes of populations living in close proximity to shale gas development operations. One of the challenges that uh, continue here in California and throughout the country are trade secret laws and exemptions under the Energy Policy Act of 2005 that confound our ability to be able to do good research and get the clear answers we want, and even with full disclosure of chemicals, which is nowhere near uh, 
our uh, ability to have in, uh, in our country at this time. It still remains because of the complexity of the fracturing fluids, et cetera, to link specific chemicals to specific health outcomes. This remains very difficult for us. In light of this, Many health professionals, such as uh, Dr. Melissa Duiska, a PSR member in New York State, have uh, been out giving numerous talks, not only in New York State, but uh, Dr. Duiska has uh, gone on many states with fracking operations to illustrate the potential health and environmental impacts. And one of the things that she really stresses in many of her talks, uh, one, one of which is posted on the PSC site, is that when we're looking at health impacts, we have to really look at the, the you know, the, 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 whole, um, the whole range of people that might be affected. It's, uh, and this, as Barb uh, well illustrated in her talk, are the vast of, uh, of array of operations that are involved with these fracking operations, direct uh, exposure to the chemicals, but all of the other social and environmental stressors that are involved in terms of populations and communities that are exposed to these. And as a result, uh, she and others within concerned health professionals of New York and the medical societies, et cetera, have called in the case of New York, up until the point of uh, Governor Cuomo banning uh, these operations, calling for a comprehensive health impact assessment that would actually put health first in terms of looking at this vast array of issues before going ahead with any uh, operations. And in case of New York, saying that it should the moratorium in, in the past should not be uh, released until such uh, uh, studies were done. A health impact assessment, uh, as illustrated here, is uh, one that's been endorsed by organizations such as the World Health Organization, et cetera that attempts to bring public health to the table, can make decisions, and I want to underscore this, should be used prior to the development and regulations uh, that would permit fracking operations, which is not the case here in California, where regulations have been developed and ready to go, and ready to uh, enact the ability to do fracking operations and, and increase the process here in California before such studies have even really been attempted. There is a process in uh, California now that's been uh, a consequence of uh, the stipulations in the most recent legislation, the Pavley legislation of, uh, of, uh, of last year. And the California Council on Scientific and Technology uh, uh, last week released the first of a number of studies, uh, this being an independent assessment of scientific and technical information on advanced well stimulation technologies in California. Uh, many of these uh, slides uh, indicate, as Barb said, that there are both uh, similarities in some cases, but many differences in terms of the geology and the types of operations that would be used in California that do underscore us to have a need to have answers for those specific implications in California. This slide from their PowerPoint that they issued as part of their briefing uh, indicated a number of points that high volume, typically horizontal wells uh, would be, are not generally used in California, so we're not likely because shale gas uh, development is uh, not as likely in California that uh, many of the issues around the vertical, uh, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the horizontal fracturing with all those numerous pads is not likely to be the sort of operations in California, although we have to watch that. They make a point here that acid fracturing has not been used in California because California overall doesn't have carbonate reserves that would buffer the acid, but of course, in their own slideshow, acid uh, type of uh, operations uh, are slated to be used because the the, uh, the geology in the Los Angeles basin would permit that and of course uh, although it's a relatively small area compared with the rest of California we know how many people live in that area and uh, has most been used historically for 
uh, getting more out of oil and gas operations and, and, and drilling sites that are already in place with, uh, with uh, this, uh, you know, being the, uh, what the, the plan basically for California with some expansion slated for the other type of fracking operations. Nonetheless, it does raise the question that even if these are going in ongoing oil and gas uh, operations, uh, that the record in California for protecting communities has not been good because of the fact that such operations uh, have largely, as, as Barr pointed out, been exempt from the usual environmental and public health uh, regulations that protect population health. Uh, within the last week, uh, this report, uh, California's at Risk and Analysis of Health, Threats of Oil and Gas Pollution in Two Communities, examined some of the implications of these ongoing oil and gas uh, operations, including the community of Lost Hills, an environmentally justice uh, challenged uh, community. And this map indicates the Lost Hills oil field directly to the west of uh, this community. And uh, surveys were done in this community as well as Upper Ojai, different types of populations in terms of their social indicators and social determinants but nonetheless uh, with uh, reports from people in each of these communities about some of the type of uh, health impacts that Barb illustrated in terms of headaches, nosebleeds, et cetera. Uh, this report indicated uh, the, the importance of, of these types of operations in terms of the threats to public health, where 5.4 million residents live within one mile of oil and gas operations with 1.8 million living in areas suffering from environmental justice issues. Uh, the uh, uh, authors of the report, uh, the people who put it together, were actually able to demonstrate with infrared uh, cameras uh, many of these emissions coming from these sites. Air sampling uh, done at the same time revealed the presence of 15 compounds known to have negative impacts on human health and 11 com compounds for which there is lacking basic health data, again, under, underscoring the uh, our LA chapter of PSR, communities for better issues have occurred within 1,500 feet of a home school, extinction to operations around the country, water use would be less, but again, we have to think about the communities that are particularly challenged in the wake of our drought and likely continued drought because of global warming and uh, impacting uh, farmers and food production. And basic quality of life is this uh, article from a few months ago in the New York Times that very poor people living here are extremely stressed, not being able to take showers, have basic running water for their needs. So we're, we should not downplay, as Barb indicated, the impacts on water in our state. There are more reports that are slated to come out by this committee under the um, under the leadership of the Department of uh, Natural Resources, Volume 2, it will be coming out in July, uh, which will be covering all of these uh, issues, water impacts, atmospheric impacts, the whole range of issues that people have been dealing with and health in their proposals for health impact assessments in New York, and which Barb covered as uh, major issues throughout the country. And Volume 3, also to be slated for release in July, uh, covers uh, these various areas and their specific issues. The problem, of course, that we have is, as I indicated, we have regulations in place where only one of these reports have come out, and Volumes 2 and Volume 3 coming out in July in exactly the same month where these regulations are supposed to go into place and facilitate new fracking operations. The question obviously comes up, how is it possible to be able to evaluate the environmental and public health impacts of these operations in any real time that should be actually make, contributing, to say the least, to the decision whether or not to go ahead with fracking. It's clearly that uh, these, this thing is, is very backwards in, in our process in California. So we're left uh, in, under the situation for us as health professionals to do the best that we can to raise these issues at a time when the economic uh, and uh, political power of the oil and gas industry is pushing hard to run the, these operations through. Many of us have uh, been working over the years, as uh, Barb indicated, with the ANA 
in working in our professional organizations on uh, policy developments, and if you want to look at the context of environmental health policies, not just on fracking, but on climate change, air pollution, in a comprehensive way, I'd refer you to our database that's been de developed in my program, the Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment at UCSF. And work within the California Medical Association. We've had a number of resolutions over the years on climate change and human health, air pollution, energy, and health. And most recently, my colleague, Dr. Cindy Russell, uh, in the Santa Clara County Medical Association, with whom I work with, authored the resolution on hydraulic fracturing, monitoring, regulation, and disclosure, which calls for uh, removing the trade secrets that I talked about to encourage government agencies to perform health uh, assessments uh, prior to uh, allowing new We have additional out of medicine to promote uh, that developed a committee of pensions but stepping out in terms of advocating for policy that protects populations. As a good example of this, ACOG and <clears throat> the Society for Fetal Maternal Medicine joined with the American Academy of pediatrics in an unprecedented way to weigh in on chemical policy reform, indicating again that there are allies in our own state that we need to draw on because of the profound chemical uh, hazard issues involved with fracking operations to see if they'll join in our efforts to protect the future uh, generations. We at PSR continue to work on this and uh, as well, and we also, as other organizations, have a wide variety of material on health impacts related to hydraulic fracturing that I would refer you to www.psr.org uh, for information on that. 